So I don't know what you were hoping to talk about this morning, but, um, but I want to talk about tattoos. <laughs> I, I don't know what you see when you see a tattoo. Um, when, I, when I see a tattoo, uh, I see a sign. A sign, um, a, a thing that points to another thing. Right? Like, this is what a sign is for. A, a, sign, a sign is never the main event or the most interesting thing. The thing that the sign is pointing to is always where the action is. Uh, think about signs real quick. You, you see signs all over the place right now, right? Um, it's election season, and so everywhere you look, there are lawn signs with names on them. They don't tell you everything, but actually they don't tell you much except the name of a candidate and the, the office that candidate is running for. And we know that the, the sign is not the person. The sign is not the thing. The sign points you to, brings to mind the thing, the person running for office. This is what signs do. And this is what tattoos do for me. A tattoo is a sign pointing to a story somewhere out there. Every tattoo has a story, uh, and I'm fascinated by these stories, whether it's the tattoo itself or the story of how someone got their tattoo, like one of my roommates uh, once who had a tattoo because of a dare, and it was a stupid-looking tattoo, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm fascinated by these stories. I'm going to tell you uh, two different tattoo stories uh, in a few minutes, but I first want to jump into our passage. I just want that to sort of be in the back of your, your mind. Because our passage this morning is about signs. And it's also about stories. The prophet Ezekiel uh, doesn't go out and get a tattoo, uh, but he does use his body in visible ways. And everything that Ezekiel does with his body has a story behind it. Our, our passage this morning is about the link between what Ezekiel does and what he says and what God is doing and what God is saying. Sign and story. And, and we, we quickly realize as we jump right into our passage that, that none of Ezekiel's actions are, are about himself. Um, after Ezekiel is, is told to, to take a brick and draw or engrave the city of Jerusalem on it and then move these like, pieces around like a battle scene, um, he's told that this is a sign for the house of Israel. And, and so Ezekiel's life, Ezekiel's body becomes a visible sign pointing to the story of what God is doing in the world. Did you know that this is what we were made for? God uh, isn't asking us to, to make 3D models of the city of Jerusalem. Um, and God, thankfully, isn't asking any of us to lie on our sides for 390 days or eat food cooked over poop or eat famine rations or shave off all of our hair. But God has called us, each and every one of us, us collectively, to be a sign that points to the story of what he is doing. This is what I want you to start considering for yourself this morning. Um, in what ways is your life, is your body a sign pointing to the story of what God is doing in the world. As we look at Ezekiel, as we look at Ezekiel's body, and as we listen to Ezekiel, and, and as we listen to him tell his story, as we learn from him about how he is this kind of sign, this kind of sign that points to the story of God, we also then notice in the story the people of Jerusalem. In chapter 5, 
as, as soon as Ezekiel has finished um, all of his business with acting out signs for 390 days, chapter five, verse five picks up and he begins to speak. Ezekiel begins to tell the story behind each of the signs. And he says this, starting in, in verse five. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. And she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations and against my statutes more than the countries all around her. If you jump down to verse seven, it says, you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you. And, and you have not even acted according to the rules of the nations that are all around you. Uh, just, just consider for a second what Ezekiel is saying. God has placed Jerusalem right at the center of the world, right in the middle of the nations. So that early in Israel's life, one of the things that God says to his people is that, that their neighbors will be in awe of them. They will look at Israel and they will say things like, what people in all of history in the world have a God that is this near them and gives them commands that are so good and wise. God's instructions were supposed to be a sign in the life of Israel, pointing all of Israel's neighbors to the, the goodness and the wisdom of Israel's God. And think about what made up these instructions. I'll just uh, put them up there in a simple list of four, like broad categories. There was a central location for worship, a sacrificial system, a set of dietary and cleanliness laws, and four special instructions around clothing and appearance. Now, now think just quickly about what, what each of these looked like for Israel. So, you worship God in a set place because that is the place where God has promised to come near to you. The sacrificial system shows you that your God is merciful and that he is eager to forgive you, right? Because he's built into your relationship a way for you to be forgiven by him. The dietary laws and the cleanliness laws, they taught you to look to God to discern between any two things. And then God's interest in clothing and appearance reminded you were this constant reminder that God was interested in every part of your life, all of the details. So think then about how this gets even more specific for Israel. The city of Jerusalem is the place of worship a system where a goat would bear the sin, bear the iniquity, bear the punishment of the people. Uh, specific instructions were given on how to avoid defiling yourself. And uh, grooming guidance uh, was meant to keep the corners of the beard long. With these four broad categories, I, can you, can you hear what's happening in our passage? Each of Ezekiel's signs point to this story. They point to this story of a God who has given good and wise instructions to his people. But listen to what Ezekiel's signs are saying about God's intentions. And so we see these, Jerusalem, the place they were supposed to gather for worship is going to be destroyed. The sacrificial system that was designed to, to teach them that they were, that God wanted to forgive them it has failed. The people of God are living defiled lives even though God has told them how not to. And so God is going to shave his people for himself. These people who he asked to grow their hair long. But it's interesting because none of this is because God woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. God's not having a bad day as we 
as we find him in Ezekiel, it's because God's people have been making a mockery of the good and wise instructions that God gave them. And they've been making a mockery of them for a long time. Ezekiel lays it out plainly. Jerusalem has rebelled against God's rules and statutes more than the nations around her. Uh, Ezekiel really like tops it off here when he says that then Jerusalem is living worse than any of her neighbors. Right? I mean, the idea being all of Israel's neighbors have a much lower standard of morality and God's people have rejected not only God's standards, but look at the neighbors and are like, we can do worse. Consider this illustration for just a second. Uh, imagine with me uh, that you are a teenager who nearly died from an infectious disease, but a group of doctors healed you. Uh, before they released you from the hospital, though, uh, they said, listen, um, there's, there's one way to guarantee that you never get this disease again, and, it, and it's spreading out there. And so here are the instructions. Every time you leave the house, you need to wash your hands with, with each of these three different solutions in this like elaborate process. And then you need to wear these, these special gloves. And if you follow these instructions, you will live. And when people ask you about the gloves and when they ask you about this elaborate hand-washing routine, you can tell them about how you were healed. And you can tell them at the same time about the danger of this disease. And you can tell them about the process and the gloves and that, and that they too can, can stay safe. But washing your hands, right? We're pretending to be teenagers. So washing your hands, three different solutions, elaborate process every time you leave the house feels tedious. And what teenager wants to wear weird gloves around? No thanks. Right? And so for a while, you remember how much, how terrible it was to be in the hospital, how sick you felt. And so you're willing to sort of go at it a little bit half-heartedly, you mix it up. So sometimes you wash with one, maybe more of the solutions, but never in the right order necessarily. Most of the time, um, depending on, on where you're going, you, you, might, you might wear the gloves depending on who's gonna be there. And so there are people who see parts of the process when you tell them about how you were healed, they go, oh, well, that, that sounds interesting. I don't want to get sick either. And so they start to pick up parts of it. Uh, so that around you, there's this strange collection of people um, who <laughs> at various times in their lives are using one of these solutions um, you, you find that some people have started wearing the gloves. Nobody quite knows the full process, but everyone around you has just kind of picked up bits and pieces. In the meantime, you have grown frustrated with others trying to protect themselves in what you know is an incomplete way. And, and, but now it's, it's been too long since you were sick that you really can't remember how terrible it was. And so you've all together stopped following any of the instructions. In fact, something inside of you has even uh, convinced you that, that not only do you not need the process, there's something special about you that got you healed in the first place. And so you're convinced. Not only do you not need to follow the process, you don't even need to wash your hands like mere mortals. Can, uh, can you hear the story of Jerusalem in this illustration? Rejecting the commands that bring life and then refusing to live by like the base standards of everyone else. Here's what's amazing and what God is saying about Jerusalem in our passage. The, the instructions that, Jer that Jerusalem is failing to live out are actually really easy instructions. So, in the scope of like moral living or somebody telling you what to do, just in general, 
going to a set place for worship and worshiping according to a, a clear set of instructions is fairly simple, right? If we go to a sports game, we, we follow the rules of what's expected of us for participation. We know where to go for that event. And we know how to participate fully, whether you call it worship or not. And then taking care of your sins through a very specific, clearly laid out process, that's kind of cake too. Like it's, think about some of your relationships. It's way easier to know that you're right with somebody, whether it's your spouse or a friend or somebody else, if all you have to do is say, I'm sorry, you're over it, right? And they say yes, and you go, cool. And you move on. If, if all you have is a very clear thing, but if you actually have to be reconciled, there's like listening that's involved, other kinds of relational strategies and you know, things that are harder. Also, knowing exactly what food to avoid so that you don't die is super convenient. And having a uniform, a uniform style of dress and fashion uh, makes life so much easier. People with school uniforms may not love it, but it's way easier come decision-making time in the morning. Right? If, if you listen to this list and you think that any of these things is hard, just know that comparatively, right? They are a walk in the park, but compared to what? Well, we're comparing these instructions to the moral and the ethical instructions that God gives his people. It's fascinating. In our passage, we don't actually hear about any of the, the moral or ethical instructions that God has given and what people have done with them. Um, but we're led to assume that if they can't follow the easy stuff, we don't even have to talk about the harder stuff yet. Later in the book of Ezekiel, we'll get to the, the explicit descriptions of the kinds of people that they are beyond diets and culture. We'll see the character of God's people. And it's, it's pretty ugly. For now, you can use your imagination. Jerusalem refuses to be a sign that points to God's goodness and wisdom. God will make Jerusalem into a very different sign because of it. Do you hear that? God has called Jerusalem to be a certain kind of sign and they have resisted historically to be that sign. And so God is going to turn them into a different kind of sign. So chapter five, verse 14, we hear God say, moreover, I will make you a desolation and an object of reproach among the nations all around you and in the sight of all who pass by. Uh, did you hear that? Jerusalem has refused to be a sign that points to God's goodness and wisdom. And so now God will make Jerusalem a sign of reproach or ridicule. So that now when people look at Jerusalem, they will see a sign that points to a story of foolishness. They will see a sign in Jerusalem that points to a story of warning. Because the people who had been rescued from slavery by their God who had been given good and wise instructions by their God, do not trust their God. They trust only themselves. And their God has given them over to the desires of their hearts. They were a sign pointing to their own self-trust and their own self-worship. Ezekiel and Jeremiah are both performing signs. But these two signs point to, to two very different stories. Now, now I told you earlier uh, that I had a couple tattoo stories and I know you guys have all been waiting excitedly for them. Uh, so here they are. I want you to think about what each of these tattoos represent, the stories that they're telling. And I want you to think about the sign that God wants you to be. So one of my, this is probably my favorite tattoo story. Uh, it's from an older guy that I got to become friends with uh, when I was in Kansas City. Uh, he and his wife 
had, had taken in this young man and they had given him a, a place to live. And, and he, uh, and they brought him in at a time when he was really struggling and when he just, he needed some structure and love and they, and they helped him find his way. The wife especially had, had been uh, like a mother to this young man uh, through his twenties. Well, about 10 years go by and the wife is now dying. And this young man comes to visit and the three of them are sitting uh, at her bedside and he, this young man just begins to thank uh, them for the love that, he, that they've shown him through the years. And he turns to her and he says that he never wants to forget what she did for him. And he tells her that since she was on his words, his butt every day to grow and be responsible and become a man, he said to her, I'm going to honor you by tattooing your name on my butt. And they all die laughing and they're just cracking up. And, and you know this, right? Sometimes when you're around the bedside of somebody who's dying, there are these moments, the unexpected moments of just joy, where you're reminded of love and, and laughter just breaks out. They laughed uh, and they'd had this kind of relationship for a long time, uh, but young man leaves. Some time passes, the, the man's wife dies, and this young man comes to visit the husband. And right away, he says to this older man, I've got something you gotta see. <laughs> so he, he pulls down his pants just a little bit in the back, and on his right buttock uh, is the name of the man's wife. But that's not all. Her name was actually written with her signature in her own handwriting because it turns out his wife thought this idea was amazing. And she sent the young man away with a paper, with a piece of paper that had her signature on it. And she told him, if you do it, you better do it right. <laughs> so tattoos have stories. I mean, can you hear it? And every tattoo is a sign pointing to the story that lies behind or beneath it. I'll tell you a different story. Uh, there's another man who got a tattoo in honor of his mom who had died. Uh, his mom was the most anti-tattoo person you could imagine. Maybe you could imagine this person. Um, in fact, she was so anti-tattoo that if she would have known that her death would motivate her son to get a tattoo, she was stubborn enough to have fought to stay alive just one extra day to extend his life without tattoos one more day. This tattoo tells a very different story from the first one. I, I, maybe not the story that you imagine. Think about these two guys for just a second, right? Uh, two motherly figures, two different tattoos, two different signs pointing to two very different stories. The first tattoo was simple. I, it was nothing more than just a name in a single color and it cost the guy almost nothing. Now the second tattoo was beautiful. It was elaborate. It had his mom's name and favorite flowers. It even had one of her favorite quotes and, and he paid a lot for this fairly large tattoo. He intended it as a sign of honor. The first tattoo was a sign pointing to a relationship. Right? Think again about this, this, this couple and the love that they had shown this young man. I mean, it showed. It, pointed to this relationship filled with love and care and deep mutual respect and a great shared sense of humor. The second tattoo was a sign as well, but a sign that pointed to a man who loved himself more than his mom. Does that sound harsh? 
I, I think that in our culture today, it's actually really hard to say something like this, right? Because the second guy truly believed he was honoring his mom. He had always wanted a tattoo. He thought that a tattoo was, was the most personal for him, an authentic expression of his love for her. He, he'd even waited until she died to get it. But we don't get to honor people in the ways we want to honor them. That's not honor. We honor people when we honor them in the ways that are true to who they are. It, it, in our lives, it doesn't matter how deeply we believe we are honoring Jesus. We cannot honor Jesus in ways that he is expressly forbidden. We love Jesus, we're told by Jesus, when we obey his commands. This is the difference between Ezekiel and, Jer and Jerusalem. Ezekiel honors God by performing the signs that God asked for. As weird, right, and as bizarre as those signs make him appear, Ezekiel honors God because they are the signs that point to the story of what God is doing. Jerusalem, on the other hand, believed she could honor her God any way that she wanted. She was just being authentic, just true to herself. Jerusalem was honoring God in ways that God had outright forbidden. So what does all this have to do with us? Well, I said at the beginning that God has called us to be a sign. A sign that points to the story of what God is doing. However, God has not placed us as a city in the center of the nations, like he did Jerusalem. Uh, God has put us as churches, tiny cities, in the midst of every nation. And God has not given us uh, a goat or a formula to take away our sins. No, God has given us his very own son to take away the sins of the world. And God has also not given us dietary laws and cleanliness laws in order to, uh, to order our lives. Instead, he has given us the law of Christ, a love where love, sacrificial, self-emptying, dying for enemies, love is, is the way and the truth and the life. And, and God has not given us a law about our appearance. No, God has given us his spirit as the evidence of his presence. God has given us. He has called us and gathered us and named us. And he is giving us to the world as a sign to point to the story of what God is doing in the world. And I wonder if the church is too often like Jerusalem and not enough like Ezekiel in the kind of sign that we are, in the kind of story that we are pointing to. I, I often wonder if the church is really good at doing things that God has never asked us to do. Uh, sometimes even things that God has asked us not to do while we're busy neglecting the actual stuff that God has clearly commanded. This brings me back to tattoos. Tattoos make up for a powerful invisible sign. Every tattoo tells a story. But tattoos are way too easy when it comes to the story that we are called to point to. I, I mean, sure, they hurt a little bit more than bumper stickers and t-shirts. But it's way too easy to change our appearance as a sign of our Christian story than it is to be the living sign that God has asked us to be. And so I, I hope you can hear me. I, I'm not actually talking about all tattoos here. I, I'm just addressing tattoos that are intended to be a sign 
of your faith. And I'm not specifically picking on tattoos because they're like anybody, like this is like a particular issue for us, but as a, an entry point to the larger conversation of the ways that we, we attempt to change our appearance rather than allow God to change our character. The New Testament doesn't come to us with commands to change our appearance, to wear crosses or Bible verses on our shirts or on our skin. No, but what we find in the New Testament are commands to be a community of character. Right? The way that we live with each other, the nature of our relationships, our interactions with each other, these are the signs that we belong to God. If God is busy in the world, breaking down every barrier that divides us, right? The, the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile. If in Christ there is now no longer Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free, then a sign of that story might be the way that we pursue and are reconciled with those who are different from us. Or if God refuses to stay distant, but is instead drawing all people to himself by putting on flesh and dwelling among us and then dying for us while we are still his enemies, then, then perhaps a sign of this story would be our refusal to hang out in a building hoping people will, will get, around, uh, get around to showing up here. And instead, we, we move into the world dwelling among people, giving away our lives for our neighbors in the way that we see Jesus doing. See, tattoos are easy. This stuff is hard. This stuff costs us something. It shouldn't surprise us that churches in America have, have long been known for what you can and cannot wear to church. We're pretty good about that here. You guys let me get away with ridiculous stuff. Don't want to remind you about Christmas. Oh, wait, I just did. Church is obsessed about what we can wear or can't wear, rather than whether there is a diversity of colors and languages and statuses when God's people get together. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us that, that churches in America are often known more for how many people show up to a gathering than by its character or the sort of, the sort of transformation uh, that is made in people's lives because of their contact with this community. We are a sign. The question is, what story are we pointing to? What kind of sign are we? I, I, I want to finish with a final thought about tattoos. Um, it's not just that they are an easy way out of obeying Jesus. I want to take it a step further. Um, this may feel like an awkward jump, but... Uh, but I think it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, uh, tell me and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> um, right? in, in Leviticus, God explicitly forbids marking your body. Which, meaning that God is forbidding his people from marking themselves as a sign of their loyalty to him. Uh, most scholars agree that this is not a universal uh, prohibition against tattoos, but specifically Marking your body with the name of God or with some symbol that would identify you with the God of Israel. Why? Why would God make this prohibition? Because God wants Israel to be a visible sign in the world among their neighbors. And Israel's neighbors all mark, them si mark themselves with signs of who they worship, of who their God is. And so Israel is forbidden from doing so. God wants them to be distinct among their neighbors. I, I, I think we ought to think deeply about whether it is good and right to tell our faith story with an act that God explicitly condemned. 
I think it's good to consider whether it actually honors Jesus when we do something just because we want to do it for him. Think again of that second story of the man who got the tattoo for his mom. What if Jesus may not have any interest in us doing something for him? Is it simply a matter of our intentions and of our heart? I wonder, I wonder if our tattoos for Jesus, but more broadly, a number of the things that we do for Jesus, if they make us a different kind of sign, a sign like Jerusalem in Ezekiel. I wonder what else we do for Jesus that makes us a reproach, that makes us a ridicule to our nations, that makes us a taunt, a mockery, or a warning to our neighbors. Is it because we've refused to do what he has explicitly commanded? All while we do the very things that he's commanded us not to do. This is the, the heart of it. While we are busy trying to mark ourselves as his. As we are busy trying to identify ourselves publicly with Christ. We miss out on the work that God is doing. And we point people toward the wrong story. See, because he has already marked us as his own. Like we have already been marked by him. He is the one who has already identified us as his own. He is the one who has invited us to his table. He is the one whose blood has set us free to be people of God. And so we don't have to mark our lives to identify with him. We find our place in his calling. We find our place in his marking. And we listen and we live responsive to his word so that we might be the sign that he made us to be, a community of character, not just any character, the character of Christ. We come to the table this morning to be reminded once again that the invitation is his, the calling is his, the sacrifice is his, we have been invited to come and to join in him, to find our lives in him, to abide in him, to allow his spirit to fill us and to move us so that we might be his people in the world.